Uh, okay, so uh, well, let's begin with history. I'm going to mix it up a little. We'll end with science, but we'll start with history. And uh, as, you, as the beginning said, I'm going to talk about gaudy religions. That means religions with gods in them. Uh, they all fall in the same way. And I'm going to focus mostly on the Western tradition, but you might start to see how these arguments will apply to even things like Hinduism and so on. Okay, so let's start with uh, the grand picture of history, right? Uh, imagine religions as species of animals, and you, you put animals in a big uh, family tree, essentially, right, of, of how they started at one, uh, one original species and that radiated out into various others, into branches and leaves and whatnot. Now think of religions in a similar way. The earliest religions date at least to 40,000 BC. Now actually we have evidence that goes even further back than that, but uh, by 40,000 BC we have shamanistic cave paintings that in, and other things like ritual burials and, uh, and things like that that indicate that there was some sort of religion going on. 40,000 years BC, think about that. Now the first priesthoods were looking at 10,000 BC when we have cities uh, and, or cities and villages and things where we have actual priesthoods established. So we've got 30,000 years where humans are walking around with religions and having religious beliefs before they even get priesthoods. But then finally they get priesthoods, it's still 8,000 years before uh, Yahweh comes along and says, oh, hey, by the way, I am the one true God. And you see, uh, of course, that's just, he does this in one tiny little place. I mean, he doesn't mention the fact that he exists to anyone but one tiny tribe of goat herders in one little place. And for another thousand years, even after that, he neglects to ever mention this Jesus character, right? So when you look at history, this Yahweh religion, this Yahweh-based uh, religion, even Christianity, just looks like one among many. It makes no sense from the perspective of a cosmic deity who would, of course, been revealing the gospel from, you know, year 40,000 BC. Uh, and all cultures, all history would show that the same God was sending the same messages to people in every culture and everywhere from as far back as we have any kind of evidence of religion. Uh, even our written records go back to about uh, 2000 BC, and yet uh, there's no evidence of this having occurred. So... History, just in the big picture, already refutes all religions, right? If there was any God-based religion, God would consistently be talking to people with the same message, the same, uh, same belief system. But that's not what we see. What we see is, looks pretty much like human invention. Humans are making stuff up according to their local culture and happenstance of history. Now we skip up to look at uh, Judaism. So we're going to start with Judaism because that's uh, the first of the Western religions that's still around and has influenced the other major two. Now, in uh, between 539 and 332 BC, Persia conquered Judea. Uh, now, I, I want to point out, of course, that those of you who know geography, you can try to find uh, Judea on there, the Palestine, the Holy Land, quote unquote. Um, it barely shows up. I mean, it, it's basically uh, almost just a red piece of a red line of the border there. And compare that, of course, to the Persian Empire. Um, looks like the Persians had better gods, apparently. <clears throat> But the significance of that is that, now the Persians, of course, that means Iranian. Uh, the modern day country of Iran is where the, is the center of the Persian culture. It's where everything Persian came from. Zoroastrianism was the, per, the main Persian state religion of the time. When they conquered the Jews and then hauled them off into slavery or into exile into other uh, Persian cities, uh, the Jews were much mixed up with and seeing the, the, basically the God system of this incredibly enormously powerful empire that easily conquered them. And they said, well, they can't have a better god than we do, so we better get some of these cool god attributes pretty quick. And so they borrowed a lot of the ideas that the Zoroastrians had and added them to their religion. These are attributes of Judaism that did not exist before uh, the exile. You won't find them in the Old Testament uh, writings that were written before uh, the Persian conquest. <clears throat> but afterwards, then you start to see it happening uh, all throughout. This idea, first of all, of a war of a good god versus an evil god, of light versus dark, that was a Zoroastrian idea. The Jews did not have that. Uh, before the Persian conquest, Satan was actually one of the right hand men of God and was doing the will of God. So when Satan goes down to cause evil, he was doing it on orders from God. Uh, he's not an adversary uh, in the sense of a, the enemy of God. Uh, but after that, of course, Second Temple Judaism started to acquire this idea of Satan as a, a rebel who took a legion of angels, rebelled against God, and was cast out of heaven, and now is responsible for all evil, and now all death in the world and so forth is this big, big struggle between the good God and the evil God, uh, you know, God and Satan and so on, which the Christians picked up. But that comes from Iran. That's a Persian idea. The idea that the world will end, uh, that was not a part of Judaism before this conquest. The idea that God's justice would be realized in one great apocalyptic cataclysm, that was a Zoroastrian belief. That came from Persia. Uh, the Jews liked that idea. They adopted it. And of course, they turned everything around so that it would be the Persians that God would melt uh, and, and not the other way around. But, um, but the idea comes from the Iranian conquerors. The idea that this world would end by a river of fire being sent by God that will flow over the universe and burn everything up except the righteous, 
Uh, that's Zoroastrian, the idea of the, the great apocalyptic burning. A new, better world that will be created in its place, uh, the, the, future, uh, the future heavenly paradise kind of thing. That comes from Zoroastrian, that, Zoroastrianism. That wasn't originally a Jewish belief. And the idea then, the most crucially, that all the good people will be resurrected by God to live in that new world happily ever after. This idea of an eternal paradise life was not a part of Judaism before. When you died, you just died and stayed dead, basically. You were kind of like a, a vague spirit in, in the earth. They didn't have an idea of an eternal paradise or an eternal afterlife, but the Jews picked that up from the Zoroastrians, and it became a fundamental requirement of Judaism. Now, when you look at the Talmud, uh, one of the requirements of being a Jew is affirming that you'll be resurrected. Everyone else is explicitly declared a heretic in the Talmud. Uh, And yet, that wasn't a Jewish belief. That was an Iranian belief uh, picked up from the Persian cult of Zoroastrianism. So when you look at this, uh, you realize that this is just man-made religion, right? This is not a, a single God who thought of all this stuff at the, the origin point of Judaism. There was no, you look at when God's communicating with Abraham in the Bible, he doesn't say, oh, by the way, the world is going to end at a certain time. I'm going to resurrect everybody. I'm going to burn everything. And there's this awful guy named Satan, and you need to watch out for him. Uh, that's not there, right? So not, all of that stuff gets added on later, and it's borrowed from a human-created religion of Zoroastrianism. So uh, certainly, this is a historical piece of evidence that shows that Mm, Judaism is not uh, a God-oriented or God-originated religion. It's just another uh, cobbled-together man-made thing. Now, uh, other things, of course, you know there are failed prophecies in the Old Testament, but related to this idea of God, of the Zoroastrian influence on uh, Jewish belief, I'm going to read one particular prophecy that is conspicuous for not having happened, uh, therefore refuting the entire Bible, uh, because they can't possibly be uh, a supernatural deity communicating to these prophets if they get things wrong. And it's also pretty uh, horrific here. And this shall be the plague, I'm going to read. This shall be the plague whereby Jehovah will smite all the peoples that have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall rot away, rot away in their sockets, and their tongues shall rot away in their mouth. That's, by the way, where Steven Spielberg got the idea for uh, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark melting. Oh, here it is. <laughs> And the same plague shall befall the horse, the mule, the camel, the ass, and all the beasts that shall be in their camps. What do the animals do? That's kind of rude. (laughs) And it shall come to pass that anyone that is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoever of all the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem, that's all the families of the earth, If they do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt even go not up and come not, neither shall rain be upon them. There'll be that plague too, don't forget, whereby Jehovah will smite the nations that go not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of all the nations that go not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Never happened. Failed prediction. But notice this idea of the apocalyptic end world, and also the idea of the Jews as the master race that the entire world will bow down to. Um, They kept getting conquered instead by other nations like the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. Uh, So consistently, history turned out exactly the opposite the way that God told them it would. And this, uh, we see, even is connected to uh, aspects of, oh, that's a shame. (laughs) This is not coming through correctly. Uh, Well, I can't read the passage. The passage is hidden back behind there, and this isn't playing. Oh, I wonder if I can make it play. Uh, let's see if this, no, I don't want to try it yet. Um, so the passage that's behind there is a passage about how God's going to burn everything up. And, uh, there's a funny, (laughs) funny line in it in Malachi 4, 1 to 3. Those who have, uh, mobile devices can look this up. Uh, and what he does, what he says there is that the, 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 the Jews who are faithful of Jehovah will be able to gamble as calves of the stall upon the ashes, ashes of the burned up uh, victims and the step upon the skulls of their enemies. Uh, and let's see if this happens. But this is a, supposed to be an animated GIF from ter- the Terminator, which uh, is supposed to evoke. Let's see if it works. No, it doesn't work. OK, so unfortunately, you lose the video effect. Um, the, but the joke was that I've heard this, so I've seen this before. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's Judaism. Uh, it, it's, and you could go on and on about that. But the point is, it's very easy to look at historical facts and show that it's a man-made religion. It, it doesn't have a pipeline to God. Uh, So it's not a divine thing. And so what they're saying about God is probably not true. But let's look at Christianity. Christianity is originated as a Jewish sect. uh, And what they did is they, uh, the original Christians, is they took Judaism and they took this other fashion going on all around them and combined them to create a new version of Judaism, a sort of uh, super Judaism. But notably, they did the exact same thing the Jews did when they were conquered by the Persians. They adopted all of these Zoroastrian ideas and made their religion different by incorporating this foreign culture that had conquered them. Well, this is exactly what the Christians then did, which is to say exactly what the Jews did again uh, by creating Christianity, is they uh, borrowed all of these ideas of these popular religions around them held by their conquerors, the Greeks and then the Romans, 
and created a new religion. Uh, and some of the gods that their new god or their new revi- or their revised sub god would be based on uh, the son of God, right? Is all of these sons of God, except the one on the end is a daughter of God. Uh, Osiris, Adonis, Romulus, Salmoxus, and Inanna are just the ones that we know for sure uh, had resurrection cults prior to uh, prior to Christianity. There are many other uh, similar gods uh, that, that could put, be put into this category, but they're harder to date. Uh, in Nana, on the end, by the way, uh, we have stone tablets dating back to 1700 BC, uh, in which she is, uh, descends to the lower world uh, into, into what we would call hell, uh, is stripped naked, uh, put on trial in a kangaroo court, is stricken dead by a death spell, and then nailed up, basically crucified. And then her minions come down and feed her the food of water and life three days later, and she's resurrected from the dead and ascends to glory. Sounds like a similar tale we've heard before, right? But it gets repeated again and again and again in all these other gods, each time transformed. All of these stories of all of these gods are completely different from each other, but have the same similar structure behind them. And the ones the Christians would most be aware of uh, are Romulus, for example. Roman state god, his death and resurrection was celebrated in annual passion plays, actually called passion plays. They were actually acted out uh, the death and resurrection of Romulus every year. It was a Roman state uh, uh, religion. Osiris, Egyptian god, those baptized, yes, baptized into his death and resurrection are saved in the afterlife. Sound familiar? Zalmoxis is a Thracian, possibly Celtic god. His death and resurrection assures followers of eternal life as well. Uh, Zalmoxis uh, was in Herodotus. This, their cult is described in Herodotus, and Herodotus was one of the main school texts that would be used to teach how to write uh, for advanced writers who are writing at the level of the writers we see in the New Testament, who are writing in Greek, which means we can be absolutely certain that the authors of the Gospels read Herodotus, because everybody read Herodotus if you learned how to write Greek that well, uh, and therefore they would know about Zalmoxis. It would not be a coincidence. And of course, uh, Egypt is right next to it the Holy Land, quote-unquote, therefore uh, Osiris would be well known to them, and of course they were conquered by the Romans, so they would be familiar with Roman ceremonies as well. But I want to caution, uh, some of the gods that you hear on the internet and so forth as being dying and rising gods were not, in fact. Uh, Mithras is one of the uh, common ones that you'll hear about. He's not a dying and rising god, uh, but he does undergo a passion. There is a passion of Mithras in which he undergoes some sort of suffering or struggle through which he acquires victory over death, which he then shares with his followers who are baptized in his name. So there is a very, uh, the similarity is still there, it's just structured differently. Incidentally, all the gospels of Mithras were destroyed, uh, not preserved. The only closest thing we have, we have hints and quotations and and suggestions and descriptions in various places and various texts, but no complete gospel. And this is the only one we have. It's actually the picture Bible version. This is a comic book, essentially, uh, of the story of Mithras from beginning to end uh, with the central events uh, in the middle. But the thing is, is this is like having a picture Bible without having the text of the Bible. So we don't actually know what's going on in each scene because we don't don't have the description. Uh, But nevertheless, we can kind of make certain inferences of what was going on through it. But this is the closest we get to the gospel of Mithras is this stone uh, comic book, in a sense. But what all these gods do have in common, including Mithras and the other ones, they are all savior gods. They are all the son of God or daughter of God. Some of them are women. They all undergo a passion. Uh, they're using the exact same Greek word, by the way, which means suffering or struggle in, in that time. They all obtain victory over death, which they share with their followers. They all do this with some form of baptism or communion or both. And they all predate Christianity. So what we're looking at here is just like the Zoroastrian scenario. Uh, all of the, this whole structural idea was borrowed and then added onto Judaism. And what you do when you take these elements and add them onto Judaism is what you get is Christianity, right? So once again, we see a man-made thing. Uh, and it wasn't a case where, like, to Ab- Abraham, God revealed in the Old Testament that there's going to be this Jesus figure and, and he's going to, if you have faith in him, you're going to be resurrected and all of this stuff. This stuff doesn't appear until, coincidentally, uh, when the Jews are conquered by a nation that has religions uh, that have these elements. So it looks like man-made, not uh, divinely made. So Christianity is just like Judaism, borrowed from other religions. Let's talk about evil. So I'm going to move on uh, into a different period of history. Uh, Well, well, it's another broad scope of history. Let's look at it that way. Um, But we'll start with uh, Epicurus, so uh, given this famous line. um, Is God willing to stop evil but unable? Then he is not powerful. Is he able but unwilling? Then he is not good. Is he both able and willing? then how can there be evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? That was Epicurus, uh, and as this meme says, atheists winning the argument since 300 BC. (laughs) There's never really been uh, a good answer to this. But we'll give one example, slavery. 
Uh, this, uh, this photograph, I don't know if you've seen this before, it's quite, quite famous. Uh, this was taken after the Civil War uh, when slaves were freed in America and this fellow wanted his uh, wounds to be photographed and preserved for memory and, and disseminated so that people would see the incredible cruelty uh, that American slavery involved. And these are Bible thumping people, right? These are people who think the Bible is, is the shit. Uh, they, did this, they did this to him. Uh, and this is appalling. How could any God stand by and watch this happening, much less watch it happening being done in his name with people citing his book, worshiping him, his actual worshipers, his actual followers, uh, without saying a word? It's in unbelievable. So what is the probability that a benevolent God would have a valid excuse not to say one heavenly word, heavenly word to his devoted believers about this ever in the whole of history, even worse in the time of uh, American slavery? And what evidence do you have supporting that probability? If you're gonna make up some excuse, how likely is it and what, is it, what are you estimating? What are you basing that estimate on? Those are the questions you would ask. But in reality, from our background knowledge of benevolent beings, because we know lots of benevolent beings, they're called humans. Uh, these humans who happen to be nice people, they're among the nice humans anyway, uh, nice humans with the power to speak unharmed, who don't have to fear anything. I mean, if you're God, you're like Superman, you're invincible, you can't have your head cut off, you can't be shot, uh, can't be burned, there isn't anything they can do to punish you, you can't have your job taken away, uh, whatever it is. Uh, if you have no uh, limitations on you that will prevent you from speaking, um, and you're, you're a nice person, you have no valid excuse not to say anything. In fact, when we look at people, all the examples of other benevolent beings who are in the position of having the power to speak unharmed, a valid excuse not to speak is so rare, we never see one instance of it. And the word rare, by the way, means very infrequent, which happens to mean very improbable. And in fact, it's gotta be at least millions to one against, because we know millions of benevolent people who are in this position who are vocally saying, condemning, uh, this kind of thing. If God is not doing it, then whatever excuse he has has to be rarer than millions to one against. So that's one way to look at it. And of course, you know many other ways to design that argument uh, in terms of pointing out that the, the excuses just don't hold up. All they do is make their theory more improbable rather than saving it. But I'm going to turn something around altogether. You've probably heard the philosophical uh, moral argument, right? The morals only come from God. People believe there are morals, therefore uh, God must exist, because where else would morals come from? Uh, well, let's look at history. History actually refutes this. Let's treat atheism and theism as two different theories here. Atheism, as a theory, predicts that moral rules will only come from human beings, they will begin deeply flawed, and will be improved by experiment over thousands of years. Note, that is exactly what we observe. Slavery is just one example of many things where the moral rules start were created by humans, they were deeply flawed, completely fucked up, one would say, and were improved gradually, very painfully, slowly by experiment over thousands of years. Therefore, atheism is vindicated by the historical record. Theism, as a theory, however, predicts a universe directly governed morally right from the start. In other words, the correct moral laws are disseminated immediately from the beginning. It would have been 40,000 BC, not uh, 800 BC. But uh, we would also possibly see the universe actually designed to be moral. Uh, we would have justice laws, stewardship of the world, enacting justice and mercy on God through God. Uh, we see none of these things. All of the things you would expect from a moral engineer are not there. But we observe no such laws built into the universe, no stewards or law enforcers, but us ever. So the theistic theory is completely refuted. Its predictions for history do not come true. It's falsified by history itself. Whereas the predictions of atheism are completely verified. So the moral argument goes the other way around. <clears throat> so that's for morals. <laughs> Now I'm going to talk about things, eh, whether they're moral or not, but they still uh, involve moral concern. Yeah, what ought you do after you wipe your butt? You wash your hands, right? Okay. Everybody knows this, G except Jesus, by the way. Uh, in Mark 7, uh, Jesus comments on the Jewish tradition at the time of washing your hands and washing your utensils before you use them for meals and washing your hands before you eat. And Jesus says, this is a human tradition. It's not in the Torah. God did not command it. Uh, therefore, it should, it's, you don't have to do it. You do not have to follow this rule. He says that things that go into your mouth can't harm you. Only things that come out of your mouth are evil. Uh, and meaning words, of course, but, uh, and blasphemies. But the point being is that he, he clearly did not know about germs, right? Uh, this is the, one, the best teaching moment in the history of the human race where if you're a divine being, the one thing you know, if you, if you stumbled across a TARDIS and were able to teleport you know, in time back to here and people mistook you for a god and were listening to you, what was one of the first things you'd tell them about is germs, right? Because there's millions of people, kids, women, men, uh, are dying and suffering in horrible ways because they don't know about germs. And simple things, simple hygiene, just cleaning your hands uh, could save countless lives. Uh, and you have this guy, Jesus, who's portrayed as going around randomly healing this or that individual isolated person, but doesn't do anything like cholera, done, gone. 
Uh, if, if it was a god, you could eliminate cholera as easily as laying on hands on the earth, right? Just no more cholera, done. Uh, that would be how a god would do it. He wouldn't walk around town like a Benny Hinn clone uh, trying to do faith healing acts. Uh, but the key thing here is that if, god, if Jesus was God or had any pipeline to God, surely he would know about germs and would teach and say, Yo, by the way, that is a tradition of men, but it's a really good one. Uh, it'll save lots of lives. In fact, you should do this more. Uh, and, and you should sterilize your instruments if you're going to engage in surgery. There's all kinds of things that you should know about. And by the way, water should be potable. You should make sure it doesn't have germs in it and so on and so forth. And clean your hands after you wipe your butt. But instead, Jesus seems to act like diseases are caused by demons inhabiting a person. In other words, he acts like the same primitive uh, mindset of the time. So here we have conclusive evidence just in the Gospels themselves. Even if you treat them as literal books, uh, Jesus is not God, because God would know about germs. So clearly, God has, a God has not been talking to anyone. For all of these, this is just examples after example after example. There are many more one could go on. So history proves God's not been talking. Islam's no different. I mean, I'll briefly just say that the Quran also fails to mention germs, incidentally. So when the angel Gabriel was rambling on and on and on with these surahs to Muhammad, um, you'd think by the end Muhammad would be pissed off that Gabriel didn't at any time mention germs. I mean, that would have been really helpful information. By the way, also so would the printing press and a few other things. Uh, the Quran also endorses slavery, including sex slavery, which, of course, the Old Testament also does. Uh, and therefore, the angel Gabriel thought slavery was really cool. Keep up with that. Like Judaism, God's promise of prosperity and superiority over all nations was also refuted by the opposite. I mean, almost all Islamic nations are failed states or economic disasters compared to much of the quote-unquote infidel West, which has all the power and wealth. Uh, now, that doesn't indicate that we're morally better than them, but it does indicate that we, if we're going to talk about God's helping us out, it looks like our God's doing a better job than theirs. But I want to point out that all of these religions are the same religion. In fact, Christianity and Islam are just Jewish sects. Uh, you're, they're all just different sects of the same one religion. They're all resurrection cults because they all teach basically the same thing and just differ on the details. Judaism says the world will one day be dissolved, the dead will be raised, and the loyal will become immortal. Christianity says the world will be dissolved, the dead will be raised, and the loyal become immortal. Islam says the world will be dissolved, and the dead will be raised, and the loyal become immortal. It's all the same religion. So let's just pick one and analyze it a little more closely. Now, I can't take credit for this, by the way. I'll read it in a moment, but uh, this is a, a meme that went around on the internet ages ago. Someone else came up with it. They're pretty brilliant because it's spot on. This is a description of Christianity, dead honest. The belief that some cosmic Jewish zombie can make you live forever if you symbolically eat his flesh and telepathically tell him that you accept him as your master so he can remove an evil force from your soul that is present in humanity because a rib woman was convinced by a talking snake to eat from a magical tree. <laughs> that is literally the Christianity that was being taught in its first, let's say, 1800 years, almost 2000 years of Christian history. Totally makes sense, right? Now, a lot of Christians say, well, okay, that, uh, that's, that sounds a little ridiculous. Okay, so um, I, I get you, that, that's crazy. So we can, we can make this more sensible. And so we came up with a, a new and improved Christianity where all that Eve stuff, okay, rib woman stalking snakes, okay, that's all baloney. We, we'll grant you that, we'll concede you that. But I still have an imaginary friend who magically manipulates the world for me, and he also magically impregnated a woman 2,000 years ago, and she bore him a son who underwent an ancient ritual of blood sacrifice in order to dispel a curse laid upon me, thus ensuring I will be immortal. Footnote, although I've never seen this work for anyone else before. Now, that's completely honest and correct analysis of Christianity, a description of it, uh, and yet it looks absurd when you actually spell it out that way. But what if someone came up to you and said, that they have an imaginary friend named Zalmoxis, who they insist is really real, and they'll never die, because this ancient demigod cleansed their soul with blood magic, which grants them the power of living forever in a magical place no one can see. That actually existed. That was the description of the Zalmoxis cult, which is attested in Herodotus, as I mentioned, 500 years before Christianity. So if Zalmoxis cult is ridiculous, Christianity is ridiculous because it's just the Jewish version of the same religion. But let's go to history more recent, Heaven's Gate cult. Uh, the Heaven's Gate cult uh, in, was in California and they committed suicide, mass suicide, believing that uh, their souls or their, the information in their brains would be teleported into a spaceship. Uh, they thought they'd get new bodies in this alien spaceship that was flying by the earth at the time. Uh, and yet this whole belief, this idea that uh, when they die, that they'll be resurrected in new superior bodies, that's the Christian belief. This is just the scientific version of Christianity. So you have them saying that they'll get new bodies in an alien spaceship flying by versus what the Christians say is that they'll get new bodies in a magical alternative universe. Um, 
the weird thing is, is the Heaven's Gate cult makes more sense, right? Because in point of fact, they're talking about quantum teleportation and neural engineering, which are actual things that exist. Uh, we, we almost have the technology now. We, we can see how to build this technology within 50 to 100 years, we'll have it. It'll be a simple matter to simply copy a brain and re re rebuild it in another, uh, another man-made body. Uh, all of that stuff is technology that's with, within human reach and within human understanding. So their idea actually made sense. There really could have been a flying saucer flying by. And if there was, and that those aliens probably could have scanned their brains and reproduced them, uh, reproduced them in new superior synthetic bodies on the ship. It's entirely possible. But let's compare this with what the Christians are saying. The Christians are saying not that. They're saying that God needs blood to fix the universe, but only his own had enough magical power to do it, so he gave himself a body and then killed it. Now, when you look at it like this, Christians are talking about voodoo and magic and stuff. They're not talking about anything that even has plausibility. The Heaven's Gate cult is actually more believable than Christianity. So if the Heaven's Gate cult is absurd, Christianity is absurd. So, okay, that all looks bad. But the usual thing is, can't we fix the plot holes with elaborate explanations? And I've misspelled explanations, I see here. Ex Explanations? I was, I was hoping there'd be a joke in there somewhere, but there really isn't. Can't we make excuses? But the thing is, if we have to make excuses, regardless of what they are, and our excuses have no evidence for them, in other words, and they don't because that's why we're making them up, right, on the spot, and those excuses are very improbable, and they typically are, like having an excuse not to mention to your own devoted believers for thousands of years that they shouldn't be uh, keeping slaves. If your excuses are very improbable, then your theory is very improbable. If you have to use an improbable excuse to tack that onto your theory, the improbability of that excuse then attaches to the theory, right? So the theory becomes as improbable as your excuse, or actually more improbable, because if you have multiple excuses, those improbabilities multiply, right? And those of you who know how to do uh, basic probability math, basic multiplying of, of probabilities, you'll notice that this probability gets smaller, smaller, smaller exponentially. And the fact still is that God has never communicated any essential scientific knowledge, ever. No, no germ theory of disease is in the Quran, in the Old Testament, or the New Testament for example, nor anything else that's significant like that. God has also never communicated any essential moral knowledge. For example, he completely dropped the ball on slavery. God has never even communicated any consistent religious knowledge of any kind, despite claims going on for 40,000 years, all these different religions, no consistency whatsoever. So these facts remain, no matter what excuses you make for them. And th these three facts are exactly what you'd expect if there are no gods, but they're not at all what you expect if there are gods. Okay, so... Maybe we can grant that. What if God is a total douchebag then, right? <laughs> Can't there be one of those? And at least then maybe, yeah, he doesn't care about germs or slaves. Maybe, yeah, he's totally pro-slavery. He wants us to die of diseases. He's a total awful a asshole. Okay, well, but he could still exist, right? So you really haven't refuted God yet. So there's really two possible kinds of douchebag gods. The one is natural beings, which are aliens, computers, and things like that. We could be living in the matrix right now, and the douchebag gods could be our, uh, our AI agents or whatever. But... Um, but we're going to rule that out because that requires positing two improbable universes to explain one of them. So that leaves us with the other kind of douchebag god, which is the supernatural being, the being that has irreducibly mental powers, a sort of a brainless, bodiless ghost mind that can just will things into existence. There are two hypotheses then left. The god hypothesis, which is that the universe was designed by a ghost even to produce life. The godless hypothesis, that the universe was not designed to produce life. And the first thing you look at is when you compare these two hypotheses is that we've done this comparison before, again and again and again. The explanation of lightning, the explanation of disease. Jesus thought it was demons. It actually turned out to be germs. And on and on and on. We have constant millions and millions of examples of where supernatural explanations were proffered, and they turned out to be false, and natural explanations turned out to be true instead. Now, when you have a horse that, w that wins every single one of a million races, and you have another horse that loses every single one of a million races, and they're about to go head-to-head -head in another race, which horse do you bet on? It's kind of a no-brainer conclusion, right? So even from the start, before I even continue, I could fold this and, and walk off stage and I'd be done, right? Uh, there's no uh, probable basis for believing in any gods, even douchebag gods. But I'm going to go on because it's funny. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, my animations aren't working, so I'll talk you through this slide. Uh, this is the history of life, right? So we've got 2.4 billion years. Uh, life began, and then there are about 2.4 billion years after that, where life was just sitting around evolving a single-celled life. Now, in actual fact, single-celled life is over six times more evolved than plants and animals just by time alone, right? 
uh, animals have only been around about 0.6 billion years, in other words, 600 million years, whereas uh, uh, single-celled life has been around 3.7 billion years, so about six times more. So single-celled life, bacteria, for example, have been evolving six times more and longer than we have. So they're actually way more evolved than we are. But in fact, the rate of evolution for single-celled life is actually 500,000 times faster than for multi-celled life like animals, which means that single-celled life is actually many billions of times more evolved than your hand, for example. So single-celled life is badass. Um, now, that makes a lot of sense in terms of evolutionary theory, but it makes no sense in terms of God. God really likes uh, bacteria. I mean, he's spending, he spent most of his time working on those suckers. Uh, but um, very little of his time working on us. So what was God doing for the 2.4 billion years fiddling around? And he's got all these single-celled organisms. He doesn't know what to do with them. He can't even figure out that maybe they could work together to do something. And then eventually he comes up with the idea that, you know what, maybe, I could, maybe they could s congregate together and make more complex entities, like algae. Algae, that's clever. Uh, so he creates things like algaes where s or multiple cells can cooperate. But he's still sticking around with those for a billion years before he realizes, oh, you know what, maybe I should have these cells differentiate their function so that we can have a more complex animal. Um, yeah, why didn't I think about that 3.4 billion years ago? Still couldn't figure it out, but eventually did, and he comes up with uh, this differentiation of cells within a multi-celled organism uh, about 0.6 billion years ago. But then it takes him 500 million years to figure out apes, just apes, right? Um, so he's tinkering around with mice and bugs and all kinds of this stuff, but... No, it takes him a while to go, apes, oh right, that, maybe I should do something with those. And then even when he gets to apes, it takes him four million years more of tinkering before he figures out how to make people. What was he doing for four million years? God, these apes are really stupid. Why can't I fix them? They should be smarter than this. Oh right, maybe I should do something with the brain. I don't know. When you look at this, you realize that this is exactly what we should expect if life is a natural product of random evolution. It would obviously take billions and billions of years uh, for us to evolve. Obviously, single-celled life would have to evolve vastly longer in order to develop the intercellular machinery and complexity to actually start engaging in cooperation. And it, obviously, once you have cells engaging in cooperation, it would take a very, very long time for them to evolve the sophisticated machinery that would allow them to start differentiating tissues and therefore creating uh, what we recognize as plants and animals. So this is exactly what we expect if there's no God. It's, it makes no freaking sense if there is a God. Even a douchebag God would be more time efficient than this. So what does the godless hypothesis predict? This is what we would expect to see. If we are alive, if we exist, and there is no God, and the universe therefore had to have come about by random chance or whatever, what would we expect to observe? What could we predict about the universe we find ourselves in? The moment we open the door and look outside, what would we see? What we would see is that almost all of the universe will be lethal to life, right? If you pick random universes, you're going to get one that... You know, if it's a universe that's completely hostile to life, obviously that you're never going to be in that universe, right? Because uh, if you're alive, you're not in that universe. So you would never observe that universe. The probability of that being outside when you open the door is 0%. But if the universe is randomly picked from among all the possible universes that could just by chance maybe produce life, then what you're going to see outside that door, if it's not been intelligently designed, is a universe that's almost entirely lethal to life, but life is just a, a very small, uh, a very rare occasional outproduct of it. Now, because we know, in this case, if life is not engineered, if it's not intelligently designed, it has to be an extremely improbable chemical accident. The right chemistry has to come together just the right way. So we know that's a cat. We have to concede that. That's true. In, in a, if there's no God designing things, there's no designer, that's the only way life could come about. But we also know from probability theory that extremely improbable events almost always occur only in vast spaces and time scales. In other words, if an event is a billion to one against, but you have a billion events, right? So the odds of you having one of those events is actually quite high. So what you would expect to see outside that door is a really enormous number of failed attempts to create life and just one or a few random successes, because that's what you would normally uh, appear to see if there's no design. But that's what we notice, right? This is what we look at. When we look outside that door, what we see is a universe that trudged along for 10 billion years before life began on Earth. We see there are trillions of galaxies, galaxies with billions of stars each, and many planets and moons on, on average per star. And that's just the part of the universe we can see, by the way. The universe is actually predicted to be many times larger than even the part we can see, so that trillions is probably a low estimate, a very low estimate of galaxies. And we notice that single-celled life, like I pointed out, evolved for two billion years before multicellular life arose from it. All of these things that we expect to see uh, if, the universe is, if life is a product of random chance and not a product of design. We could have predicted that without even knowing it before we looked outside the door. But it gets worse than that. When you look at the universe and map and catalog what's in it, 99.99999% of the universe is a lethal radiation-filled vacuum. Think about that. That's almost the entirety of the universe. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit that is not a lethal radiation-filled vacuum. 
So God really, really likes lethal radiation-filled vacuums if he's the designer. But it gets worse than that because once you erase all of that and you just, let's just focus on the stuff. Okay, there's very little stuff. It's almost all deadly space. But what's left, let's look at that. We just look at the material. 99.9999999% of all the material in the universe composes stars and black holes on which nothing can live, right? Think about that. Like most of the matter in the universe is dedicated to these gigantic things called stars and black holes that are vastly huger than planets. All that mass, and they are exactly the one place where life is not going to be found. They're incredibly lethal and hostile life. You can't live there. And then, okay, so set aside all of that and just look at the tiny little crumbs that remain. 99.99999% of all the other material in the universe, space dust, asteroids, planets, moons, is barren of life or inhospitable to life. That's an extremely bizarre thing to observe for an intelligently designed universe that's supposed to be custom built to make life, right? This is actually the opposite of what we would expect then. But this is exactly what we'd expect to see the moment you open the door if there is no God, because the only universe we could be in is one like this. Or at least the probability is extremely high. That's what we'd see. And I want you to think about this in terms of scale. Imagine this house that I've got up here. Now imagine this house contains the entire universe that we know about, the entire known universe. The amount of volume in this house that would be hospitable to life, the rest of it is completely entirely lethal to life, the amount of volume that would be hospitable to life would be smaller than a single proton. Not smaller than a bacterium, even smaller than the proton in an atom in a bacterium. If you walked into that house, would that, you see that it's almost entirely lethal to life and you, you couldn't even find the one proton that life was living on in there, would you conclude that the house was designed to create life or designed to be hospitable to life? No, you'd conclude the opposite. Now, it's, it's worth pointing out that Aristotle actually thought the universe was much more conducive to life than this, and he described it a complete cosmos. In, in going all the way to the stars, it was completely inhabited and completely inhabitable. Aristotle's universe was 10 to the power of 30 times more hospitable to life than ours is, which means Aristotle is a vastly better engineer of universes than God would be, apparently. I, mean, I think even a douchebag God could outdo Aristotle, um, but evidently not. So the results, we cannot predict any distinct features of this universe on the God hypothesis. Almost all the distinct features of it are unexpected. To the contrary, the God hypothesis predicts very different observations should be made. But we can successfully predict numerous very weird features of this universe, its vast size and its incredible lethality and all of that, on the Godless hypothesis. In fact, the probability that the universe would look like, the, look like this, the way I've described it, is 100% expected. It's exactly the universe we should expect to see the moment we look out the door. Now, uh, so then what they'll come up with is, well, but fine-tuning is so improbable, and the universe requires fine-tuning. The problem is, is that their God requires more fine-tuning. In fact, they're proposing, first of all, they're proposing something we have no evidence of, a, super, a, a brainless mind, a mind without a body. Um, we have no evidence that that's even a possible thing. So they're already off the rails from the start, but even if we grant them that, what they're proposing is that there is a mind that just happens to exist for no reason that is at least as complex as the human mind because it has to be at least as intelligent as a human and at least have at least as much knowledge as a human. In reality, of course, their god they're imagining is vastly greater than that and therefore vastly more complex. But if you're going to pick random soulless or random bodiless minds out of a grab bag of all logically possible bodiless minds and you want to get something that's human intelligent or better, you're going to have to get information specificity equivalent to human or better. In fact, information specificity, the complexity of human intelligence is in the vicinity of 10 to the power of 5 billion. So think about that, 10 to the power of 5 billion. That's extraordinarily unlikely. In other words, the attributes required for a creator are extraordinarily improbable attributes to have. Theology thus posits an even greater coincidence than a random universe. They want to explain a mildly finely tuned universe by positing a massively finely tuned God and not explaining where that fine-tuning came from. And maybe they'll go to gods all the way down, like the turtle argument, uh, but I think that's a losing way to go, and you know they won't go there. So here's the summary. No moral god is likely to exist on present evidence, quite clearly. Only very improbable excuses can rescue that, rescue god from that. No supernatural causes or communications have ever been discovered, but millions of natural ones have. Excuses make no difference to the resulting probability. And the universe is contrary to predictions of any likely god hypothesis. Only improbable excuses make it fit. And the universe is exactly what is predicted by the godless hypothesis. Even really weird predictions come true. And that's the state of things, and that's where we get from science and history. So we could write Ulan Kalufid's book uh, long before he actually is supposed to have written it, according to Douglas Adams. <clears throat> and I could say, well, that about wraps it up for God.
Thank you.